Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Well, today I'll actually be doing my first half marathon to support HIV, AIDS, orphans, In India, the proceeds of this year's campaign will go to build a new orphanage uh, for girls. Their current situation has them living in a school that's really just inadequate for uh, them. You can help out and support my uh, walk by going to 524.greatdetectives.net, 524.greatdetectives.net. Also, over at greatdetectives.net this weekend, check out my review of Tickets for Death, Michael Shane Mystery, and you can get all of my reviews automatically sent to your Kindle and can try that service out for free for two weeks. Just search for the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio in the Kindle store. Well, now it's time for today's episode of Dragnet, the original air date, December the 15th, 1953. And this one is The Big Brink. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a robbery detail. A gang has hijacked and robbed a bank truck. They've stolen over $100,000. There's no lead to their identity. Your job? Get them. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Thursday, June 5th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of robbery detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Chief of Detective Stad Brown. My name's Friday. I was on my way back from the business office, and it was 10.52 p.m. when I got to room 27A. Robbery. Did you get him? Yeah, here's the gun. You got the double out, Buck? Yeah, Jack. Here you go. Any word yet? No, we ought to be hearing pretty quick. Nothing from Herman and Benson, huh? Last we got from them, they were over on Hobart. No action there? Nothing. I get it. Robbery Friday. Yes, ma'am. That's right. Well, when was this? No. No, that's a burglary. If you'll hold on just a minute, I'll have you switch them. Yes, ma'am. Hold on just one minute. Would you give this call to 2524, please? That's right. Burglary. Thank you. Woman who wants somebody to come out and talk to her about her husband's work pants being taken from the clothesline. You should have gone out. Yeah. You got a cigarette? I'm fresh out. Here you are. Got a man? Yeah, thanks. Well, you might as well sit down, take it easy. You got no idea how long we're going to be here. Guess so. You know, I'm still not real sure about how this tip came in. You want to fill me in? Call came through this afternoon. Man refused to give his name, just said he had some information he thought we'd like to have. No idea who it was, huh? No. Said it wasn't important. Went on to say that he could tell us where to pick up the men who held up the bank truck. Well... Well, I figured it might be a crank, so I asked him how we could be sure the story was true. How'd he answer that? Said he could prove it. Said he had some of the serial numbers on the stolen bills. The checkout? Yep. Gave me the numbers from 10 of the 20s. I checked the serial numbers. They're good. And that's when he said he'd call back, huh? Yeah, said he'd call tonight around 10 and give us the address where we could pick up the men. It's late now, about an hour. Yeah. But he knows what he's talking about. We gotta be here when the phone rings. No way of getting an ID on him, huh? None. What'd he say about the men? They heavy? And the way he tells it, they're loaded. Got all the guns and ammunition they need to hold out for a week. Hmm. He knows that. Why couldn't he give us the address this afternoon? He said he wanted to put a lot of distance between him and the rest of them. See how many there were? Not right out. The way he talked, though, we figure there's three. Any names? No. Said he'd tell us where to pick them up. Said when we blew the whistle, they'd tell us. Uh, I'd be a little tight taking them then, huh? 
If the way they handle the guards on the truck is any indication, it isn't going to be a picnic. How many men we got? Herman and Benson, we can call them in. Murph and Rafferty, Stewart and Creasy. Where are they now? Well, I saw Murph and Raft out at the business office just a minute ago. Said they'd be right in. I get it. Robbery Friday. Yes, it is. Where? Yeah, put them through. Call from San Francisco. Operator says station to station. Might be our boy. Huh. You'd have to fly up north to get her this fast. Airlines don't ask for recommendations when they sell a ticket. Wait just a minute. This Friday. Who's this? Okay, if that's the way you want it. Yeah. Give me that address. All right, let me read that back to you. 1657 Garfield Place, apartment 408. Is that right? Okay. Why don't you tell us your name? It won't do any... Hello. Hello. Let me hung up. I'll have the business office get on it, see if they can come up with a number. You got the address? Yeah, I got that. Here. The way he put it, job might be tougher than we figured. What do you mean? Well, I asked him his name. I told him it wouldn't make any difference if he told us. Yeah. He said make a lot of difference. Said they'd kill him if they found out that he finked on him. That figures. Yeah. Said that when he reads in the papers that they're dead, then he'll come in. When they're dead? Yeah. Says we won't take him alive. 10 days previously, on Thursday, May 26th, three men had stopped an armored truck on its way to the Federal Reserve Bank. The truck had stopped for a collection on Wilshire Boulevard. The three holdup men had approached the truck and produced sawed off 12 gauge shotguns. At gunpoint, two of the men forced the drivers to go out to the San Fernando Valley. The third followed in another car. On a side road south of Ventura Boulevard, the suspects had tied and then beaten the driver and the guard. The two men were placed in the back of the truck, and after stealing all of the cash in the vehicle, the thieves had driven off. As soon as the theft was discovered, men from the Federal Bureau of Investigation were notified. Together with them, Frank and I followed down every lead. The crime lab went over the truck but found nothing that would help us in getting to the thieves. Latent fingerprints were able to come up with nothing. The driver of the truck and the guard had been shown the mug books, but they were unable to make an identification. The method of operation was checked through the stats office, but when the leads that developed were checked out, we were in the same position as when we first got the call. We had no idea who the thieves might be. Descriptions obtained from the two victims were broadcast to the entire nation, but there were no kickbacks. The FBI weighed and sifted all evidence in its Washington headquarters, but they came up with the same results we had. Nothing. The phone call from the informant was the first concrete lead that we'd gotten. There were nine men from robbery division and three teams from the FBI in the operation. From the information we had, we knew the suspects were armed and they were dangerous. The people in the building were gotten out of their apartments. The building itself was completely surrounded. 1.36 a.m., we moved in. Boys in the street are set. Let's go. All right. Did you check the manager? Yep. Yeah. Descriptions of the men in the apartment match the one we got from the driver of the truck. Checks out to be the same guys. The manager say how many there were? Three. She's not sure they're all in. All right. Sounds like somebody's moving around in there. For real. You ready? Yeah. Let's go. Hey, police officer, stand still. What are you doing in here? You here alone? Yeah, alone. What are you looking for, a convention? Where are the other two? What two? Nobody else, Joe. Closet over there looks like an arsenal. Loaded with guns. Couple of sawed-off shotguns. You guys got no right to come in here like this. I don't know what you're looking for, but you ain't gonna find What's it. What's your name? Hank Peterson. You rent this apartment with two other guys. Manager tells us that they're Harvey Fitzgerald and Lou Colton. Is that right? Yeah, they live here. Where are they now? I don't know. Out. Maybe to a movie. I don't know. When do you expect them back? Well, look, they're big fellas now. They don't have to get me to sign a report card. They do what they want. They went out. I don't know where. They didn't tell me. They also didn't tell me when they'd be back. Well, what's this all about? Where'd you get those guns in the closet? They don't belong to me. Who do they belong to? One of the guys. Which one? Why are you coming in here and asking all these questions? I ain't done nothing. You got no beef with me. I don't know anything about the guns. Maybe Lou likes to hunt. I don't know. They belong to Colton, huh? Yeah, he brought them. You don't know where he is now? I told you. If I knew where he was, I'd tell you. I don't want any trouble. I don't like to have people pointing guns at me. Would you put that one away? Turn around. What? I said turn around. Get over to the wall. Put your hands up on it. Big deal. What happens now? You kick my feet out and I fall down? Stand still. I'll get a job. You ain't gonna find nothing on me. I tell you I'm clean. <clears throat> nice try, Peterson. Here's a 38 coat. Joe had it in his belt. Mm. You go around pretty heavy for a fellow that doesn't want trouble, don't you? I carry a lot of money. Sometimes I think some guys are trying to take it away from me. I've got to protect myself. Yeah. Anybody's got the right to protect themselves. Yeah, you got a permit for this gun? No, I didn't get around to it yet. I'm going to, though, right away. I'll get one. You know how it is. You mean to do something, but you forget. Hey, can I stand up straight now? Yeah. Come on, Peterson. Get your hands behind you. Maybe you guys will tell me what this is for. What are you looking for? We'll tell you downtown. Well, you know you're making a big mistake. Is that right? Well, sure, you really call this one wrong. You're dragging in an innocent man. I'm clean. 
I made a mistake when I didn't register the gun. I'll cop to that, but that's the edge. I don't go past there. No, you got it wrong, Peterson. Read me how. We got you going in for the bank truck robbery. You and your two friends, you're going to stand for it. Keep talking about my two friends. I got no friends. I move in with a couple of fellas. Now all of a sudden, I got a piece of some action there shoving. You got it wrong, cop. You aren't going to tell us you happen to be here at the wrong time, are you? Look, I'm from Chicago. I got a lead on a job out here. It gets cold in Chicago in the wintertime. I don't like the cold. I get a lead on a job out here in California, so I put an ad in the paper telling how I'd like to drive out with the guy, share expenses. The fellow that answers the ad wants to leave when I got to go is Luke Colton. I took a third of the tab driving out. We got into town. He's got this apartment lined up, this one right here. I got no place to stay, so he says for me to pad down with him. That's it. The beginning, the middle, the end. Anything outside of that, I don't know. If you got trouble with Lou, then take it up with him, but don't make me fit in. I got no part of the action. I don't want any. What about the gun? Hmm? The gun you had on you. I tried to explain that. I meant to get a permit for it. I didn't get around to it yet. What about the ones in the closet? Well, talk to Lou. They belong to him. Maybe he's going to open a museum. All right. Let's get out of here. Come on, let's go. Look what you did to the door, breaking it up like that. No reason. All you had to do was knock. Landlady's going to be pretty sore about it. I'd have let you in if you'd have knocked, breaking up a door like that. She's going to be real sore. Probably won't talk to me. Well, it's going to be a while before she's got the chance. While Frank and I took Henry Peterson downtown, the other officers from robbery maintained the surveillance on the apartment. Because of the construction of the building, it was impossible to wait inside of the room. However, all of the entrances were covered. 2.40 a.m., we checked the suspect through R&I, but we found that he had no record in Los Angeles. His fingerprints were taken and forwarded to Washington for checking. It was printed and mugged and then placed in a cell in the felony section at the main jail. The rest of that night, the watch in the apartment continued without results. The following morning, Frank and I met with Lieutenant Smyers at a special show-up of the suspect for the driver and the guard of the armored car. Without hesitation, they both stated positively that Peterson was one of the men who'd held them up. The kickback arrived from Washington with the information that Peterson was wanted for escape from the state penitentiary in New Jersey. He'd been convicted on a charge of murder and robbery and given a life sentence. The record showed that he'd escaped from the prison on Friday, May 9th, two weeks before the truck had been robbed. 4.15 p.m., we had him brought from his cell and Frank and I talked to him in the interrogation room at the main jail. You got a cigarette? Yeah. Here. Thanks. Here's a match. What do we got going? Same thing. We want to know about the robbery of that armored car. You figure there's something I could tell you on it, huh? We wouldn't be here otherwise. I'll make you a deal. We don't make them. No, no, hear me out. You might go for this. We can't promise you anything. You're asking me to come over to your side. Seems like you'd be willing to come a little closer to the line. What do you got to say? How bad you got me nailed? As deep as it can go. For real? That's right. We'll lay it out. All of it? Yeah. We got the kickback from Washington. We know you're wanted for escape. We checked the guns from the apartment. Found out they were taken in a burglary in Chicago Tuesday, May 13th. Go ahead. We checked with the Chicago papers. The ad you told us about asking for a ride out here, it was never run. You guys are sure thorough. The victims of the robbery identified your picture. They sure? They're sure. No chance for a mistake? No chance. If I cop out, where am I going to do the time? We don't decide then. You think they'll send me back to Jersey? I told you, we got no say in that. It's so cold back there. It's nice here in California. I'd like to stay here. Nothing you guys can do so I can take the fall in Quentin, huh? Nothing. Any way you hear it, I'm nailed, huh? That's right. Okay. Maybe it's marked down that I copped out to let me stay in California. It'll be put down that way. Okay. Where do you want me to start? Try the beginning. Good a place as any. You were with the holdup, huh? Yeah. How about the other two? You picked them up yet? No. They haven't come back to the apartment. Might be good if they didn't. Where do you come up with that? Heavy, real heavy. What are their names? Luke Colton, Harvey Fitzgerald. Those are the names in the mailbox. Are they real? As far as I know. You aren't sure, huh? No. Part of what I told you is true. I broke out of a jail in Jersey, then beat it to Chicago. Laid around for a couple of days and started to look for some action. I was broke. I needed a score to set me up. Sitting in a bar down on State Street one night, and I met Lou and Harvey. They tipped me to the job out here. You mean they came all the way out here to pull the one job? Yeah. They got a rumble about how it'd be a cinch. Came out to run it off, and then they figured on going back, leaving you cops with nothing. When were they figuring on leaving? I don't know. This was their part of the deal. I told them going in, I wanted to stay out here. Didn't make any difference to them. We all figured that if we cut up a $100,000 score, none of us was going to look bad. For all I know, they might be on the way back now. Their clothes were still in the apartment. You know how many suits you can buy with a third of $100,000? Go ahead. Yeah, well, after the job, we made the split. Talked it over and decided to dig in for a few days and then take off. At least they decided to leave. Didn't say when. I told you now they might be on the way back now. Who else knows you're in on the job? Huh? Outside of you three, Colton, Fitzgerald. Who else knows about it? Isn't anybody. Well, where's your part of the money? Got it down the bus depot. Got it in the locker down there. How long's it been there? Since day before yesterday. How often do they clean out them lockers? Every 24 hours. 
And then there's $33,000 floating around in the check room. You got the key to the locker? Yeah. Where is it? In my shoe. I got it taped from the sole inside. You want to give it to us? Well, no, but I don't guess there's any other way. No. Okay. You spend any of the money? You mean the stuff we stole? That's right. No, not a dime. Why do you ask that? Who else might know the serial numbers on the bills? Well, nobody. Nobody but us. And I guess the guys at the bank, they got a record of them, I guess. How about Colton and Fitzgerald? They spent any of their part? I don't know. You got to ask them that. The car you drove out after the armored truck. Who'd that belong to? Colton. It's the one we drove out here in. What kind of car is it? Plymouth, 1952. What model? Sedan. Color? Uh, light blue. You know the license number? No, I never paid any attention to it. What state's it out of? Illinois. Who drove the car when you went on the holdup? Harvey. Fitzgerald, huh? Yeah, he drove the car and Lou and I went in the truck. Either of them been arrested before? Well, I'm not sure, but I think Lou fell in New York. I'm not sure, though. How about Fitzgerald? No, at least he never said anything about it. Only way I knew about Lou is that he talked about the food in Sing Sing. That's the way I knew about him. You know what he fell for? Armed robbery, I think, and there was a kidnap rap, too, but he beat it. He out clean? I don't know. Seems like you planned a job with two guys that you didn't know very well, doesn't it? I was hungry and I was cold. I wasn't about to ask for a life story when they offered me a part of the action. How'd they pick you? I told you, I was in a bar on state. Lou and Harvey came in, both of them were carrying a load. I was sitting there drinking beer, just the three of us in the place, and Lou was drinking pretty heavy. He gets in a beef with the barkeep, and I saw the roll he was carrying, so I figured that if I could take his side in the brawl, maybe I could make a touch. We walked out of the bar, and he offered to buy me a meal. Next thing I know, I'm on the way to California. I'm a partner in a piece of goods that looks safe. All that time in the car, and you didn't find out anything about your two partners? We drove straight through. When we weren't driving, we were sleeping. Anyway, I wasn't a solid member of the club. I wasn't about to get my nose mashed in for having it someplace where it didn't belong. I figured if they wanted me to know something, they'd tell me. Did you go with them for the guns? No. They already got knows when I fell in. You knew they were stolen. Guys turn up with that kind of muscle and can't come from anywhere else. Sure, I knew it was stolen. Colton and Fitzgerald have any friends out here? No, not in L.A. Anywhere on the coast? Well, I hear Lou's got some people up north. Where? Maybe San Francisco, Marin County, I don't know. Might even be Oakland. Somewhere around the Bay Area. They say anything about going up there? No. Of course, they might have. The way Lou likes to eat, coming out here, he'd go ten miles out of the way because he knew a place that had a good chili size. Think nothing of it. Never saw anybody who liked to eat so much. Real gourmet. Only with him, it was glutton. He mentioned any names of people he knew up north? No, just said he had people. Anything about the car they're driving that'd make it easy to spot? What do you mean? Well, like a dented fender, a scratch, anything to identify it. Yeah, yeah, it might be something. There's a kind of scratch in the back left fender, I think. Woman backed into us on the way out here. Cut right through the metal. You think of any reason why they might ditch the car? No. We kept a close tab on the papers right after the job and looked to see how much you had on it. When we didn't see anything, we figured the car was all right. I don't think they'd ditch it. It'd be pretty easy to trace. Lou owns it outright. Unless you want to try to grab cold plates, he'd drive it like it was. Okay. We'll get you your things, and you can come over to the city hall and make a statement. How about the key to the locker? Oh, yeah. There it is. Probably some money due on the package I'll have to owe you. We'll take care of it. <laughs> Too bad, isn't it? What's that? 33000 I haven't got the dough to bail out the package. Well, it works out even. What? You'd have no place to spend it. An immediate APB was gotten off carrying the names and descriptions of the two suspects. Also a description of the car. A radiogram was sent to DMV at Illinois, requesting the license and description of any car registered to a Lewis Colton. While Eleanor Eastlack took Peterson's statement, Frank got in touch with the telephone company. They'd finished checking the phone call we'd gotten from San Francisco, but the information they gave led us no farther toward apprehending the suspects. The call had been made from a pay booth in the ferry terminal building. We got in touch with the FBI and filled them in on the developments. As a result of Peterson's statement, the number of men maintaining the surveillance at the apartment on Garfield Place was cut to one team working days and one team working the night watch. We put a call in to San Francisco and talked to Chief of Inspectors James English. We filled him in on what had happened. He assigned Inspectors Sutton and Zimmerlin to work with us on the case. 5.46 p.m. We checked out a trip car and we left for San Francisco. It took us a little under 10 hours to drive the 405 miles between the two cities. At 4.03 a.m., we stopped in Oakland and put in a call to the San Francisco Police Department. How much? Yeah, just a minute. Frank, you got a quarter? Yeah. Thanks. Here you are. 264, please. Hello, this is Joe Friday. Yeah. You got a message there for me from Charlie Sutton or Jules Zimmerlin? Hmm? Yeah. No, no, we just got in. Yeah. Oakland. What? Just a minute. You see that street sign up there? Yeah, wait a minute. Uh, Fifth and Poplar. Fifth and Poplar. Yeah. No, we're coming right over. When was this? 
I see. Well, if Charlie calls in, tell him that we're on the way, will you? Right. Thank you. Well, we're almost too late. What do you mean? They got a lead? Sutton and Zimmerlin called in 30 minutes ago. Yeah. They got the car waiting for the suspects now. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. The address the business office had given me on the phone was a large garage located at the corner of Union Avenue and Lynch Streets. When Frank and I got there, we met with Inspectors Sutton and Zimmerlin. They told us that when they'd gotten the APB, a call had gone out immediately to the officers in the city to be on the lookout for a 1952 Blue Plymouth with a dent in the left rear fender and carrying Illinois license plates. The suspects had parked the car in a no-parking zone on O'Farrell Street between Taylor and Mason Streets. At the peak hour of traffic, the car had been towed away from the parking place and left in a garage. While it was in the garage, the information on it had been received from our department and an immediate stakeout was placed on it. We felt reasonably sure that the suspects would return for the automobile. They had no reason to think that there might be anything wrong. The address of the garage had been left so that they might find the car. All that would be necessary to release it would be the payment of the fine for overtime parking along with the towing and garage fee. The garage itself was a large building. It provided four stories for parking. The suspect's car was on the basement level. We were able to keep watch on it from a small office near the exit ramp. The attendants were instructed to act as if nothing was wrong when the suspects came in. Once we knew that they were in the building, the entrances and exits would be blocked and they would be taken into custody. There was nothing to do but wait. 5.30 a.m., no sign of Colton and Fitzgerald. 6.15 a.m., Frank went out and brought back some hot coffee. 6.45, 7 a.m., people began to come into the garage to get their cars, but not the two suspects. The later it became, the more difficult it would be for us to take the two men into custody. If there was going to be any shooting, we'd be in a bad position with civilians in the range of fire. 7.30, 8, 8.04 a.m. Somebody coming down there. Yeah. You see who it is? No. Jules. Yep. You and Charlie want to cover the other side? Right. And watch it. We should be able to get a pretty good look at him. Yeah. Lousy deal. You parked the car and you pulled off the street. What kind of town is this? They got a sign. You should have put it in the garage. Yeah, you and your smart ideas. You read. Why didn't you see the sign? Who can tell you? It's Colton and Fitzgerald. Yeah. You see Jules and Charlie? Wait a minute. Yeah, over by the gray murk. Looks like they're all set. All right, let's go. Now, let's get this crate out of here. Ask some drinkers to the rope if you got. Under the cops pick their bank. They shoot it would be more than you. Still not sure it was the right thing to do. But you don't have to think. If I wanted somebody for that, you'd still be back east. You know one of these days you're going to open that mouth just a little too wide. Yeah, what do you guys want? Police officers, you're under arrest. Runner! Hit him off, Jules! Get the ramp, Joe. I'll get him. This isn't the way out. You follow your own, Matt Cop. The doors are blocked, Colton. You're in here for good. You wear your own kind of glasses. I'll get out. Now, look, we got you for robbery. Don't make it anymore. Joe? Yep. He's over in the corner. How about Fitzgerald? Sutton and Zimmerman got him. Threw their guns in their lap. On no part of trouble. Colton doesn't figure it that way. I'll try to get around him. Right, watch yourself. Keep those people back out of the doorway. Go on, Frank. I'll cover you. There's three more, Colton. You aren't going to get by all of us. Your partner quit. Why not be smart like him? He's not smart. He's scared. All right, Colton. I'm coming to you. You do it. You'll be dead when you get here. Go down that gap. Colton? Colton? See him, Joe? No. Take it easy, Joe. Colton? How about it? He's hit. I can't tell how bad. He's still got the gun. Colton! You can hear me throw that gun out here. Nothing. Come on. Better call an ambulance. Right. Uh, never should have taken us. Better take it easy, Colton. You're hit where it shows. Never should have taken us. Two of you... Two of us. You got it wrong, mister. Huh? You were outnumbered going in.
The story you have just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On September 18th, trial was held in Department 92, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Harvey Ned Fitzgerald and Louis Jeffrey Colton were tried and convicted of kidnapping, robbery in the first degree, and violation of the Dangerous Weapons Control Act. They were found guilty and sentenced as prescribed by law. Kidnapping is punishable by imprisonment for a period of from 1 to 25 years in the state penitentiary. Robbery in the first degree by imprisonment for a term of not less than five years. Violation of the Dangerous Weapons Control Act by imprisonment in the state prison for a period of not less than five years. Henry Vincent Peterson was remanded to the authorities of New Jersey for completion of his sentence. A hold was placed on him by the state of California in the event he is paroled. Be sure to read the current issue of Photography Workshop for an interesting and informative look behind the scenes with Dragnet. That's Photography Workshop, the current issue. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Herb Ellis, Vic Perrin. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Watch an entirely different Dragnet case history each week on your local NBC television station. Please check your newspapers for the day and time. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. Hear Merrill Muller and the news next on the NBC Radio Network. Hi, this is Andrew from otrwesterns.com. I wanted to invite you to come take a look at our site where we put out podcasts of old-time radio westerns. Check us out at otrwesterns.com. You're listening to The Great Detectives of Old Time Radio with Adam Graham. Now let's get back into the show. Welcome back. Well, I think this is the first time I've ever heard anyone ask to be sent to San Quentin. Of course, uh, he didn't end up getting his way, at least not in this particular episode. Uh, but on the bright side, uh, he does have that hold placed on him in, uh, uh, by the state of California. So if, uh, he ever does get out of prison in New Jersey, he's got like, uh, his own prison retirement in, uh, San Quentin. Uh, at any rate, uh, we turn now to listener comments and feedback and Bill, uh, comments on the big odd, it was good to hear Virginia Gregg again. It's been a while. And that's a great point, uh, Bill, because it used to be on uh, Great Detectives of Old Time Radio that we heard Virginia Gregg all the time. You know, it would not be a surprise if we heard her in, you know, two or three shows per week just because of the number of episodes and, and all the guest spots she's done. Uh, but we're doing so many New York shows, and obviously she wasn't here in New York. Um, and, uh, she also didn't do any guest spots on Rocky, on Rocky Jordans. And I don't know why that was, but she was never as far as Radio Gold Index says, anyway, on Rocky Jordan. So we haven't, uh, been hearing her near as much, and it is nice to hear her just because she's such a, great professional and did so many wonderful characters in the golden age of radio. 
All right, well, that will actually do it for now. Join us back here tomorrow. We'll have video theater. It'll be an episode of Dragnet. And uh, and that's at videotheater.greatdetectives.net. And then we'll return on Monday with Old Time Radio uh, with uh, Mr. Keen Tracer of Lost Persons and be back next Saturday with another episode of Dragnet. In the meantime, send your comments to Box13 at GreatDetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off. <laughs>